one of the great important memories of, or lessons of, uh, of how to think about war crimes is that if you get too technocratic about how you define them, and they're just defined in a limited tactical sense, then we Americans are pretty bad war criminals ourselves, even in the Great War, even in a war where most of us would have no doubt that the United States was on the side of morality in a broader sense. But in an effort to make sure we won and won decisively and relatively quickly, we took the gloves off. And even when we knew we weren't really incapacitating German industry or Japanese industry with our strategic bombing campaigns, we decided that it was still beneficial to essentially obliterate their neighborhoods uh, in their major cities. So hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Mary Eintema, president of World Boston. We're delighted that you're joining us tonight for great decisions, whether here at the Boston Public Library or virtually on Zoom. We're really honored to welcome uh, Dr. Michael O'Hanlon. I will reveal that over the past couple of days, I've been getting emails from people saying, oh my god, you've got Michael O'Hanlon coming up. That's really cool. And we're like, we know. Uh, so I'll abbreviate his uh, long bio, but you can read it in full on our website. Uh, Dr. Michael O'Hanlon is a senior fellow and director of research in foreign policy at Brookings, where he specializes in U.S. defense strategy, the use of military force, and American national security policy. He directs the Strobe Talbot Center on Security Strategy and Technology, as well as the Defense Industrial Base Working Group, and is the inaugural holder of the Philip H. Knight Chair in Defense and Strategy. He co-directs the Africa Security Initiative. Mike is an adjunct professor at Columbia, Georgetown, and George Washington, and is a member of the International Institute for Strategic Studies. He serves on the Defense Policy Board at uh, the Department of Defense and was a member of the External Advisory Board at the CIA from 2011-2012. He has written several hundred op-eds in major newspapers and is the author of many books, including most recently, Military History for the Modern Strategist, which was published in January. So with that, very happy to turn things over to Michael O'Hanlon. Hi, everyone. It's great to be in Boston, such an amazing city with such history and such intellectual firepower, and certainly on the issues before us tonight, a city that continues to contribute so much. I want to talk about war crimes in a broader context, less about any kind of narrow technical lawyerly definition or agenda because I'm not a specialist on international law and don't really know I can do a good job with that, but to try to place the question of war crimes in broader context and then after having done so, try to ask what this particular moment, this juncture in the Ukraine war, uh, offers us by way of possibilities and where the war crimes issue can play in. Because as Mary just so accurately pointed out, let me begin with just sort of the facts of the case for war crimes in Ukraine. There are two ways to think about this, maybe others, and I look forward to your comments and questions, but for me there are two ways. One is the full range of atrocities that have occurred under the guise of this, uh, you know, for Putin, special military operation but clearly an aggressive war. And that for me were symbolized, and for much of the world were initially symbolized with the deliberate killing of civilians around the city of Bucha, north of Kyiv in March of 2022, as well as the shelling of apartment buildings, which sometimes, you know, have, uh, the shellings have sometimes hit hospitals and schools and bus stations and private homes. Uh, drone strikes and missile strikes, also the, uh, the terror attacks against cities and even civilians. So there's that category. And by the way, I've, I've uh, been to Ukraine twice in my life. The last time was last September, where we went to Bucha, and the Ukrainians really wanted us to see the aftermath of the massacre. To be honest with you, what was most striking on that beautiful September day was how far they had already recovered from the massacre. This was before the missile and drone strikes started targeting Kyiv, but six, seven months after the initial onslaught. And so, Actually, the Ukrainians were showing remarkable resilience, and my memory was of charred out vehicles, but overall a nice day and a population that clearly didn't want Vladimir Putin to win or subject them to, uh, you know, 
a, a state of mind that he could choose. They wanted to choose resilience themselves. Anyway, th that's the full range of actual war crimes as we think about them in common usage. Then there are the, que the questions of technical, provable violations. And as you know, the international community has struggled with this question of war crimes over decades, and we've certainly had the Nuremberg trials after World War II, for example, where we actually considered the war crime to be the entirety of what the Nazis or the Tojo government in Japan did to their neighbors and, frankly, to their own populations. And the convictions were not overly narrowly defined or specified. And then we went through a few other modern era uh, tribunals of one type or another, including for Yugoslavia, where Milosevic was convicted, as you'll recall, uh, Charles Taylor of Liberia, a couple other cases. But in the creation of the International Criminal Court, again, as Mary pointed out, the United States ultimately decided we shouldn't join because the worry was that our leaders could be tried for war crimes that were not intentional, but that were perhaps either mistakes of strategy mistakes of implementation, or just political disagreements by some world body that we didn't trust because you know how America has a very uncertain relationship in certain quarters with the idea of multinational governance, the whole United Nations system, et cetera, et cetera. And so we're not party to the ICC, but it is the ICC that as of this past winter indicted Vladimir Putin personally on the charge not of killing civilians in Bucha, not of shelling apartment buildings in the Donetsk region of eastern Ukraine, not of destroying a dam, even if that plays out and is, winds up being something that Putin's forces arguably did or, or clearly did, perhaps, as we may find someday. None of that. As, as many of you will recall, he was indicted, and that is the right word, uh, clearly not arrested, indicted for the deportation of children from Ukraine, from Russia occupied Ukraine to Russia proper. He pulled those children either away from their families or from orphanages and he hasn't let them go back. So it's fascinating in a sense, it's, it's macabre and horrible and heinous, but it's also fascinating to think of why that particular charge is the one leveled against a guy who arguably has done even worse things, or at least even bigger things. Because at this point, the estimates are that probably more than 50,000 Ukrainian civilians have died in this war. Maybe 12 to 14 million have been displaced from their homes, and certainly that puts a lot of strain on families. A lot of Ukrainians have lost their fathers and brothers and, and mothers and sisters in battle, because the estimate at this point is that the Ukrainians have suffered maybe 30,000 combat deaths in addition to those civilian fatalities, and the Russians may be 50 or 60,000 combat deaths. And so the scale of what Putin's done overall with this war far exceeds the specific allegations against him, but the ICC feels that it can prove what happened with the deportation of children. And also, now I'm going to pull back, and what I want to do for the next 10 minutes or so is sort of imagine seeing the world through Vladimir Putin's eyes and imagine that I'm Putin for a second. Don't imagine it too much. I don't want it to come true in your heads, but, but um, imagine how he would rebut this allegation that we make in the West that he's a war criminal. Because when most of us say it, we're not just talking about the deportation of children, as bad as that is. We're talking about the full enchilada, starting with Bucha or even starting, you know, with the way he leveled Grozny 20 years ago when he first came into power, the way he helped President Assad of Syria barrel bomb apartment buildings where there were suspected Syrian insurgents when he sent Russian forces there starting in 2015. He has a pretty nasty legacy of using force, even if in some ways this is the most blatant and egregious. So I think Putin, what I'd like to do is, is sort of walk through, therefore, sort of how Putin got to this point in his thinking and why he would say that what he's done is defensible. And I actually think that if he were here tonight, he, he probably wouldn't bother to give that speech, but if, if he were forced to somehow speak for his actions, he would believe his own defense. It wouldn't just be to fool us. He believes it. He lies tactically, but he believes in a fundamental agenda for the Russian state under his leadership. And he believes in sort of the broad course of Russia through history as now being guided by 
Vladimir the Great, which is what he wants to be in the tradition of Peter the Great and Catherine the Great, the two 18th century Russian rulers who really built the Russian Empire and made Russia into the modern megastate that it's been ever since, even though it's gone through multiple permutations, obviously, with Soviet times and so forth. But for, for Putin, seeing history in this way, everything he's done has made sense to him and has even been justifiable. So if you don't mind, I'm going to sort of take uh, this particular prism on the war crimes question, because rather than just have one American talk to another American or group of Americans, all of whom probably dislike Putin coming in, so you know, how much can I accomplish by just reinforcing how bad of a guy he's been for these last 16 months? And again, I'm not going to indulge or ask you to indulge me in trying to benefit from my understanding of international law, which is probably less than some of you in the room, and certainly not enough to base a 30-minute presentation. But I have spent a lot of time trying to understand Putin over the years, partly because I'm lucky to have um, friends like Mary, who is originally a Russia scholar and eight-year resident of Russia herself, as she just told me, but also uh, Fiona Hill at Brookings, who I think has been here in previous talks, uh, Catherine Stoner at Stanford, Lise Howard, my co-author, we've been writing about uh, a security architecture that's different from NATO that we think might be useful in helping to end this war. And that's where I want to wind up, with linking the war crimes question to the issue of how do we help conclude this conflict in some way, rather than simply using war crimes as a way to reinforce our moral stance, but with no benefit strategically for how that might facilitate an end of the war, which is what I really care about, and probably what you really care about as well. But I, I do think it's useful again, in thinking through what war crimes mean and making the distinction between immoral behavior by leaders of states or militaries on the one hand, but technical legal violations of international law on the other. These are two very separate, related but separate things. I think it's worth sort of weaving our way through history a little bit. And it's also, I hope, something I can do uh, based on the book I wrote that came out this uh, winter that Mary kindly referenced that's called Military History for the Modern Strategist, America's Major Wars Since 1861. So I spent a lot of time thinking about World War I and II, Civil War, Korea, Vietnam, Iraq, Afghanistan. And let me begin with World War II. I think Putin, if he were here tonight and he was asked to defend himself against this international criminal court charge that he, you know, is guilty of war crimes, he would point out, he might want to start with World War II, and he might want to point out that we, the Americans, allied with his country at the time, bombed cities all over the world, or at least in Japan and Germany, and ultimately used atomic weapons designed just to ob obliterate entire city centers, including obviously all the people who live there. And we started our strategic b bombing campaigns, and as they intensified really in 1943, 44, with the goal of incapacitating German industry, German war industry. And we, so we had sort of a technical goal in mind for what we thought that bombing could do. But it didn't work very well. And we weren't accurate enough in our bombing. And so we wound up with a strategic bombing campaign that ultimately killed hundreds of thousands of Germans and hundreds of thousands of Japanese. And of course, the firebombing in Tokyo was the worst of it all, even worse than the Hiroshima and Nagasaki atomic bombings. I'm not saying all this to give Americans or our, you know, our ancestors a, a guilt trip. I'm saying that if Putin were here, I think he would say, you guys have done some pretty nasty stuff too because war sometimes requires you to do really bad things. And the justification that Stalin and Roosevelt and Truman all had in World War II is that the Nazis started this, the Tojo government in Japan started this. What they were doing was far worse than even what we did, and all the gloves had come off, and therefore anything that could help end the war faster became justifiable. In other words, there was a relativity to the morality based on the fact that we needed to end the war successfully and quickly if possible. And therefore, one of the great important memories of, or lessons of, uh, of how to think about war crimes is that if you get too technocratic about how you define them, and they're just defined in a limited tactical sense, then we Americans are pretty bad war criminals ourselves, even in the Great War, even in a war where most of us would have no doubt that the United States was on the side of morality in a broader sense. 
but in an effort to make sure we won and won decisively and relatively quickly, we took the gloves off. And even when we knew we weren't really incapacitating German industry or Japanese industry with our strategic bombing campaigns, we decided that it was still beneficial to essentially obliterate their neighborhoods uh, in their major cities. So Putin, I think, would offer the defense, and of course Soviets, uh, having lost so many people to the Nazi armies in 1941 and 42 and 43, once, once the Soviets reversed the course of ground warfare, the atrocities the Soviet troops committed against German citizens, German civilians, uh, you know, just peasant farmers, their families, were horrible. But also Putin would say, can you really expect an 18-year-old Russian soldier who maybe saw his own family slaughtered a couple of years before by those same Nazi troops to show mercy at that point. So let's be real and let's also recognize going back to this point when the Soviet Union and the United States were allied with each other that war crimes are to some extent in the eye of the beholder. He might also point out that in Vietnam in particular, we used a lot of those same bombing concepts and capabilities that we had developed in World War II, except against a more elusive and less urban enemy. And we had, again, some military definitions of what we were trying to do with napalm and Agent Orange and just massive B-52 bombings of the Ho Chi Minh Trail and Cambodia. We were trying to interdict supply lines. We were trying to prevent the Viet Cong from being resupplied from North Vietnam and from China. And so again, we had a military purpose, but the effect was ultimately really to kill a lot of Vietnamese without having that great of an impact on the logistics efforts that the Vietnamese needed to carry out to keep the war going. And we knew that for quite a while and kept the bombing up anyway. So I think Putin, who's a man of history, granted he sees it his own way, but on this particular argument, he might have a kernel of truth. He would say, you Americans used amazing amounts of brute force against an urban, or excuse me, against a rural underdeveloped population. And your justification was you thought you had a military rationale and you were fighting this global communist scourge that was so dangerous to the planet that it had to be stopped anywhere and everywhere, including by you know, destroying a village to save it, so to speak. So the other big lesson that comes out of looking through this history and that Putin would be sure to tell us about if he were here, I think, is that, I mean, if, if the lesson of World War II is be careful who you call a war criminal because sometimes you gotta do pretty nasty things if you're fighting an even greater evil and you may wind up doing things that you're not proud of but that you really don't see an alternative if you're trying to win the war quickly, decisively and with high prospect of success. The lesson in Vietnam might be sometimes you just make really bad intellectual decisions about the techniques that are going to be useful for winning a war. And it's not that we wanted to kill all these Vietnamese villagers, but we were making, frankly, bad decisions that a lot of people at the time knew were bad and more people should have realized. By the way, in my book, of, with these seven wars that I look at, the Civil War, the two world wars, Korea, Vietnam, Iraq, and Afghanistan, the only war where I'm really pretty tough on the military itself and pretty critical of the military is Vietnam. I mean, other wars we made a lot of mistakes, but I think the bigger mistakes were usually made by the civilians. In Vietnam, it was, I think, shared responsibility, civilian and military, and the military tactics were abysmal. And we should have known better that, to me, that was the least impressive period of American military performance in any of the wars I studied. And it's sort of ironic because a lot of the people who were in senior positions of leadership during Vietnam had cut their teeth, so to speak, in World War II and, you know, in the Great Noble War. And apologies, because I realize there's still Vietnam vets in our midst and certainly a lot of families with Vietnam vets. I'm not trying to impugn the morals, but I am saying technically and tactically, we made a lot of really bad choices that could be framed as war crimes based on the specifics of what happened to people that we were attacking, even though our goal was not to kill them for the sake of killing them. So Putin would point out, a lot of this seems to be in the eye of the beholder. And also sometimes by trying to win a war, if you make a mistake, you may wind up committing what some others call a war crime, but they have no real sense of why you did it 
or what your real choices were. So these lessons of history tell us that it's pretty hard to get a clear, firm handle on what is a war crime. And if you start saying whenever bad things happen in war, that's a war crime, it's a pretty slippery slope towards saying virtually any war is bad. And in, it, of course, that's true at some level, at a human level, almost any, maybe every single war is bad, would have been better not to have. And very few wars are fought with, you know, a solid, strong discipline through the ranks and a battle plan that really goes out of its way to spare innocents. Uh, I think we came closer to doing that in Iraq and Afghanistan, but even there, with, at best, very mixed results. So it's tough to define war crimes. If what you mean by this is distinguishing between the bad things that happen in war and the mistakes people make in war versus the things that are just criminally negligent to the point where you want to lock people up or even hang them. And so Putin would then, I think, work through, there are a few more things I wanted to say, but tracing through the history, I'll do it quickly, because I think it's also important to understand then why and how Putin would defend what he's done in Ukraine. And I think if you try to trace the evolution of Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin from KGB officer through rising political figure in 1990s Russia to then premier and president of Russia and prime minister for four years in between the two long blocks of his presidency, then there are a number of things that really shaped his worldview and ultimately contributed to his decision last February, or whenever the decision was made before that, to attack Ukraine comprehensively, you know, building on what he had already started eight years earlier in a more limited way. And I think we have to get ourselves inside of that mentality to have the war crimes is issue in any way usefully influence how we think about strategy going forward, which to me is, again, the real question. And I think Putin would say, starting with the Kosovo War in 1999, where NATO ganged up on Serbia, Serbia being a Russian friend that, of course, World War I started partly over Russia defending Serbia. <laughs> and so this had a history. And um, we did this without a UN Security Council resolution. So by one definition, what we did was illegal. You can debate whether it was a war crime, but a lot of innocent people, not that huge of a number compared to other wars, but a substantial number died in a war that we did not have international legal basis for fighting according to international law. However, I supported the Kosovo War, so I guess I'm a war criminal too, or at least an aider and a better, because I thought that given what we had seen Milosevic do to the Bosnians earlier that same decade, what he was starting to do to the Kosovo Albanians could not be tolerated. And the fact that NATO, as a group of democracies that had never used offensive force as an alliance before, could agree as a group unanimously to carry out this operation to protect the coast of our Albanians. To me, that was an adequate alternative to international law in the proper sense. But I admit, once you start going down this path, it may look good to me as an American. I'm not sure it looks good to everybody in these rows because I just heard a couple of people remind, you know, agree with me that the Kosovo War did not have international legal standing. And so there are certainly critics in the United States of that decision, but also Putin himself and most Russians saw this as sort of a hegemonic act by a powerful United States along with its allies uh, in complete disregard for the fact that this kind of an operation should have been legitimated by the UN Security Council, where of course Russia would have vetoed it, but still, those are the rules. And Putin would have said, you guys, you Americans say you're so high and mighty, you always say you're playing by the rules, that's nonsense. You play by your own rules when it suits your interest and then you find some excuse for when it doesn't. Again, I'm not taking Putin's side. I think the guy's a horrible, heinous human being. And I think this narrative he constructs has so many holes in it and so much vindictiveness and so much self-righteousness that it, it should be torn apart and, and should be challenged. So I support our efforts to help Ukraine stay afloat and alive. But I also believe that Putin really does endorse this narrative. And if you read his speeches, his big speeches over the years, if you read the essay that the Kremlin published in beautiful English, they went out of their way to translate it very nicely. In the summer of 2021, when Putin explained, and I'll get to this in a second, he explained why Ukraine was not really distinct from Russia and couldn't be allowed to break off and go to the West. 
what you start to realize is Putin does a lot of lying tactically, but his worldview, he puts, puts, puts it out there for all of us to see, and it's sincere. So he thinks Russia is a great empire, that as he put it, uh, the greatest strategic catastrophe of the 20th century was the dissolution of the Soviet Union. That's a remarkable thing to say, given all the other bad things that happened in the 20th century, but Putin said it. And so the idea of Russian weakness really, really deeply offended and, bo and bothered him. What Yeltsin did to Russia in the 90s deeply offended and bothered him. And Putin came into power and you know, helped Russia get back on its feet in the 2000s, partly to get Russia strong again, to make Russia great again. And Putin sort of did it for a while. And he tried to get along with us along the way. You'll recall that he was the first foreign leader to call President George W. Bush after the 9-11 attacks. He wanted to convey his endorsement for us using the same kind of scorched earth tactics against Al-Qaeda that he had used against the Chechen rebels and would again. And so he thought we could sort of link arms as great powers in imposing our will against groups that did these sorts of things with what Tom Friedman of the New York Times might have called Hama rules, if you remember his original book from Beirut to Jerusalem, and he talked about how the first president of Assad in Syria, when he found an uprising in a town in, in Syria called Hama, he just went in and basically destroyed the town, like Old Testament style, in order to make sure the word, he probably left a few people alive to get the word out of what he had done to 99.5% of the others. And for Putin, that's the smart way to put down protest, <laughs> because even though it looks brutal, and it is brutal, it tends to be effective. At least this is what Putin thinks. Now, we all know it doesn't tend to be effective, and you know, I hope he's learning that in Ukraine. He thought he could squelch the Ukrainian resistance very quickly. He's clearly wrong. But he would endorse the notion that using an iron fist is a more effective way to put down these kinds of revolts. So then he saw us go into Iraq and Afghanistan, and we're talking about protecting civilians, and we're talking about spreading democracy, and we have all these high and lofty goals of what we're up to, but we wind up with these wars that go on for years, where hundreds of thousands of people die, uh, thousands of our own people, but hundreds of thousands of Iraqis and Afghans, and to Putin, this looks like the Americans are either completely hypocritical or completely sanctimonious, that they think that what they're doing is so, they can't even see the effects of what they're doing or they just don't understand how to use power. Because it's not good enough to just tell yourself you're trying to protect civilians if your overall strategy leads to a prolonged war. So for Putin, better to use the iron fist, win it quickly. Yes, some innocent people die, but the overall situation is resolved more quickly. And the place where this really applies for him is Syria, where in 2015, after four years of the United States basically saying, we want political change, we want the opposition to overthrow President Assad. We want some kind of a broader coalition government. But we could never make up our minds who to help, who to give weapons to, who was sort of reasonable enough and moderate enough that we could see them as a better and viable alternative to Assad. And so we just kept making a lot of noise about how we wanted change, egging on an insurgency that we never really helped get strong enough to defeat Assad, and I did see this at the CIA External Advisory Board, because we were getting briefings in 2011 and 12 on the likelihood of Assad being overthrown, and the United States thought he would fall. He didn't fall. The war got worse. Hundreds of thousands died. We weren't doing the killing, but in Putin's mind, our stupidity or our hypocritical approach to this conflict was just as bad, if not worse, than somebody who would drop barrel bombs on an apartment building to kill the five insurgents inside, even if you also killed 50 innocent people along the way. And so that's the set of tactics that he then endorsed in Syria when he intervened with his air force in 2015. Okay, so specifically on Ukraine, and then a word on maybe where we go from here, and then I look forward to the discussion. So the way Putin applies all this, I think, to his decision about invading Ukraine in 2022, what he would say there is not so much that Ukraine was trying to create a violent unrest that you know, would overthrow the Ukrainian government or overthrow the Russian government or cause violence, 
but he did think that the CIA and other American agencies were quite active in supporting certain Ukrainian political leaders, forcing out, pushing out his friends, his cronies, and he was sort of half right about that. For, from our point of view, we were empowering democracy, and I think we were right about that, but from Putin's point of view, we were also meddling in former Soviet affairs, and ultimately, as you'll recall, right after the Sochi Olympics of 2014, the pro-Russia strongman leader in Ukraine fled after this big dispute about whether Ukraine should join the European Union or have an association agreement with it. And Putin saw that guy as basically being driven out by the West. So he, he heard us say we're in favor of democracy, but what he really thought is we're in favor of weakening him and all of the people around him, the friends around him, the former sort of greatness of Russia is now coming under siege from all directions. And then the worst of it is, also at that same time period, the United States had effectively campaigned against him when he ran for president in 2012, which is part of why he developed that great hatred against Hillary Clinton, because she was Secretary of State at that moment, and why I'm sure he considers you know, his damage to her candidacy in 2016 one of his great accomplishments, because it was payback. So this is the way he sees the world, that we were all trying to come in and essentially dominate in our own sanctimonious, sacrosanct way, the former Russian, former Soviet space, even to the point of dominating the politics of Russia itself. And then we try to pull Ukraine away from Russia and into the West fully. And for Putin, and again, I, I would recommend you go back, if you haven't yet, and read that I think it's about a 15-page essay from the summer of 2021 at the Kremlin website. It's basically Putin's view on history of the last thousand years. And if you really have time, what I would recommend is read that, and then a book that I would uh, advocate everybody looking into by Plotky over at Harvard is uh, about Ukraine, the bridge between East and West, his, not his latest, but his previous book to that. Because what you see if you read this very serious Ukrainian historian and you read Vladimir Putin, is that Putin sort of gets about three-fourths of it right, but he twists it at the same time. And, but what he, does, what, he, what he does think and really believe is that Ukraine and Russia have a common origin. They really are a common people, except, of course, the Ukrainians should recognize they're the kid brother, they're the weaker partner. Kyiv was a center of original rule and power for both Russia or Rus back in the day, and Ukraine. Ukraine itself didn't really take on its current borders throughout history until the last 30 years. And it was constantly sort of like a, you know, accordion, expanding and contracting with the Cossacks in the middle, the pro-Russian Orthodox in the East, the Polish and Lithuanian empires in the West, the Ottomans around Crimea to the South. So it was constantly this contested space and it was where East meets West and where East has to assert itself. Because if it doesn't assert itself in Ukraine, which is sort of its natural buffer, then the West, whether it's Napoleon or Hitler or more insidious modern sort of, you know, less obvious violent forces, but still very prevalent and powerful cultural forces, will keep coming in at Russia too. So Putin views this as the ultimate buffer, the ultimate place where the fight has to be won. Ukraine is the prize that cannot be lost. So as the West gets closer and closer to bringing Ukraine into the European Union and then someday perhaps NATO, Putin, his anger is going through the roof because he's not going to lose what Catherine the Great and Peter the Great and other Russian leaders over the years had worked so hard to create, to build, to conquer as they tried to both, for both offensive and defensive reasons. I think Putin is equally motivated by the desire for Russian greatness and the fear of Russian encroachment from other outside powers that either want to militarily or at least politically and psychologically defeat it. So in that great context, with a thousand years of history at his beck and call, Putin's not going to see, uh, even though he thought the war would go fast and didn't really want all this killing, but he's not going to see the loss of a couple hundred thousand people, even of his own Russian troops, as being an excessively high price given the stakes historically for him. So he's going to reject categorically the notion that anything he's doing is a war crime because for him, just like in World War II, the ends justify the means. And he would say, you Americans are familiar with that argument because look at what you did to the German and Japanese cities. So you're willing to have the ends justify the means 
in, in wars that you consider existential, and that's all I'm doing here. Anyway, that's my broader take on the war crimes issue as Putin would think it, but let me finish by now asking, is there anything useful out of all of this discussion? So far, I've been sort of at a philosophical and semantic level. What's a war crime? What's not? You know, how do you view history from different perspectives? The question is, what use is any of this for trying to end the Ukraine war? And I don't have all the answers by any means, but I will say a couple of things. First of all, Putin is obviously not going to be impressed by the charge that he is guilty of this spe specific war crime. He knows full well that far worse things have happened in this war even than the deportation of children. And he's been the guy who decided to do it. But he thinks he was in the right. Second, when the Ukrainians harp on their 10-point peace plan, I don't blame them for having this plan, but when one component of it is Russians who are guilty of war crimes must be held accountable, that's a non-starter. I think we all know that in our gut. But I think we're going to have to recognize that when we accuse Putin of a given war crime uh, or anyone else in the Russian military and political system, that there is you know, a, a controversial aspect to even, even if the ICC followed its own technical guidelines, there is an element to this that is so fundamentally debatable that the Russians aren't ever going to accept this as a legitimate point of reference or point of debate for a peace settlement if we ever even get to that point. So we can talk about it. We can try to use this for our own purposes, but it's not going to be something the Russians ever buy into. But third, we should keep at it anyway for two reasons. One, it, it limits what the rest of the world will do to support Putin. And two, it telegraphs to Putin that if you're thinking about doing even worse things, like using nuclear weapons, that the world is willing to make distinctions between debatable uses of lethal military force on the one hand and things that are so far off the charts that we are prepared to call them by a different name altogether. And we're creating a, a body of international law and a a set of processes that will give legitimacy to those charges. And so I think that the indictment of Putin this year has almost no immediate bearing on the war, but it does telegraph to Putin the world's watching, and most of the world knows a lot of what you've done is wrong, even if they don't all want to take our side in punishing Russia. Even the Chinese have not shipped weapons to Putin in any kind of substantial numbers that we're aware of. And Putin, I think, knows that if he escalates this thing even further, that he may lose his oil and gas markets that he still does have. He may lose any hope of ever being welcomed back into a quasi-community of nations, and, uh, or even in the countries like China that still treat him as friends. And so I think there's a utility in that. But my, my final point would be uh, we're going to have to be realistic about the terms of whatever peace deal becomes within our grasp or within Ukraine's grasp over the next year or two, because I think we have to be careful about how we talk about the war crimes issue in our own mind. We should all be very angry with Putin, but there's going to have to be a separate track of thinking that also considers what kind of a compromise with this sort of a monster is acceptable because there probably isn't going to be a way to defeat him comprehensively, drive him from power, or win the war categorically for Ukraine. And so my final word is a word of caution to be careful of and, and to be very specific of how we use the war crime issue in our own thinking in a case like this. As much as it wants to be a channeling of our emotion, our outrage, and our moral indignity, and it should be, I think it's important to still have that just be a piece of our overall strategy, a, an element of our overall approach, and to recognize that we're probably going to have to be a little bit flexible because this is not like 1945 where we can drive Putin from power and send him to the court and ultimately hang him. Uh, that'd be nice, but I don't see it being within the realm of the possible for a country that has nuclear weapons and that is so far from any kind of overall military defeat itself. So that may be a frustrating place to leave my opening remarks, but hopefully we can wind up in a less frustrating place by 7 p.m. So I look forward to your uh, reactions. Thank you. Wow. So can I say, since 1918, that is what World Affairs Councils do. Wow. 
What a great talk. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you. Um, all right, so uh, questions which end with a question mark and are spoken into a microphone. And we don't have tons of time, but we'll get a couple. So down here, okay, down here. Um, and then keep your hands up. Okay, anyone else? Okay, got it. All right. Do you want Go me right to take, ahead. Let me take Go notes right and take a few at the same time. Uh, what's, your, what's your preference? Yeah, let's do that. So we'll go okay. uh, up to the very top row also. We'll get yours, ma'am, right in the middle. May, I think you're close. Oh, well, he's got the mic, so we can't do that. Um, all right, go right. Now we're all set. Go ahead. Thank you so much. Really appreciate you sharing oh. your insights right. and analyses this okay. evening. My question actually concerns Afghanistan, if you're willing to field it. Um, I realize the international gaze has shifted from Afghanistan, but I'm still trying to unpack the nature of our 20 year engagement there. Okay. Um, my question is I'm curious your assessment of the greatest strategic misstep or perhaps the greatest lesson learned from our time in Afghanistan. Thank you. Great, and then we'll get your question. We'll do two, how's that? Good. Thank you very much for your talk tonight. Anthony Blinken, uh, not um, Secretary Austin, said that uh, Russia is the second best army in the Ukraine uh, recently. Uh, given your most uh, recent comment there, I'd love you to comment on that. Thank you. Great, uh, excellent questions. Um, On Afghanistan, it might or might not ever have been doable. I don't know. But the, you asked for the one overarching mistake, going in light and then trying to make up for lost time by surging fast. Those were both bad ideas. I was part of the second bad idea. I supported the second bad idea because I thought there was no choice. And a few of us who had been big uh, supporters and students of what happened in the Iraq surge maybe got too enthusiastic that modern American counterinsurgency methodology could work even in Afghanistan. The problem is Afghanistan is not Iraq, and it couldn't absorb that much of an inflow of resources on that accelerated of a timeline. So I think President George W. Bush did too little in Afghanistan, and then President Obama tried to make up for time by doing too much too quickly. And the you, you worsened the corruption problem. You built unrealistic timelines for how fast you could create security forces. And then, of course, the fact that Pakistan was keeping the Taliban leadership alive and well over the border made things much, much harder as well. So that would be my short answer. On um, Secretary Blinken, who's a remarkable, uh, brilliant, and very ethical person, uh, and I, you know, he also tends to have a way of finding comments like that one that are hard to argue with. It's not really clear what they accomplish. I don't have any problem with him saying it. But if what he's trying to do, I think, you know, I don't know what the context in which he said it. I can't object to it. I would just worry that it can, I, in my judgment, it can lead to a perpetuation of an idea many Ukrainians have right now and some Americans that Ukraine's going to win this war on the battlefield. And what I mean by win, I mean comprehensively evict Russian forces from all Ukrainian territory, even Crimea. I, think, I don't really think Blinken believes that in his heart, but he probably has to say that for now publicly. And we should certainly give the Ukrainians a chance to get back as much as they can for the next few months. But I think we're going to have to be ready to take stock of where we are in the fall. And I'm not a MAGA Republican, but the MAGA Republicans who want to ask, how long do we keep the spigot open at the level of 50 billion a year, that's a fair question for when we get to the fall and probably the Ukrainians have only taken back a fraction of the territory that Russia currently holds. And then we have to ask, do we really think that reinforcing the same style of effort just because the Ukrainians have the second or have the better military on their own soil, does that really mean that if we just keep helping them more and more and more and more, someday they will achieve all their goals? I think that's gonna be a debatable proposition. So that's what I would uh, suggest in regard to Blinken's comment, even though it's certainly not wrong. Uh, but, you know, Russia's now done a second mobilization. Russia's got nuclear weapons. Uh, this thing escalates in certain directions. More attacks on Russian territory. Who knows where Putin's willing to go with nukes? So uh, that comment may be true within a certain set of parameters, but it doesn't promise Ukrainian victory. Okay, thanks. Uh, so we'll go to Zoom. Question from Zoom. Uh, thank you. I'm reading a question from Mary Mendoza from Zoom. 
How can we expect other countries to take the ICC seriously if we, the United States, are not members of it? The question is beautifully put and answers itself. <laughs> so in the interest of succinct succinctness, I will just make that point. I will also say that the American leadership that didn't want to join the ICC, watching now how the ICC is handling Putin, I think should be somewhat reassured because, again, the ICC isn't just saying we hate your war, Russia, we hate the fact that you're killing innocent people. Uh, no, the ICC is applying very specific criteria and investigating in a very legalistic way. And so this makes it less likely that a future American president would be indicted because he or she tried to defeat the Taliban in Afghanistan and wound up hitting you know, and killing innocent villagers inadvertently. And that could be construed as a war crime in, by certain perspectives if you were not being overly, or not being adequately diligent and rigorous in your application of the concept. So I think the way the ICC is, is performing now should be a reassurance to us that we could and should join. Okay. Interesting, wow, so many questions. All right, we're gonna go. Uh, across the aisles. We'll go to you, sir, on the edge, um, and then we'll go over to Ed. Um, and we are running out of time, so uh, a question with a question mark. Oh, um, very quick. Uh, thank you very much. It was a very interesting um, discussion. But we have to look at the uh, indictment on Putin. He's bringing the children in, out of a war area. Right. So maybe he was just trying to save them from getting killed in the middle of the battle. So, I mean, that's a possibility. But one thing I've seen Putin do in March of 22, he was discussing peace with the um, uh, Ukrainians in Turkey. And then Boris Johnson said to the Ukrainians, don't, don't negotiate. Then he negotiated not to bomb the nuclear power plant. He negotiated the grain deal to let grain go out of uh, Ukraine, and he, he did that again this year, so he did that twice, and then he threw out the Christmas truce, which the Ukrainians rejected. So where's, where's so the question? It's the question is, points, but what, what about uh, President Biden? I didn't hear one olive branch or anything from the American side who was supplying all the weapons. A hundred billion dollars of our money is going to this Ukraine war. Okay. A hundred billion. And why isn't the Americans doing anything for diplomacy? Great, thank you. And then, uh, Ed. Uh, yes, um, quick, uh, you're, there was, you're right, there's zero possibility that Vladimir Putin's gonna end up in, in their court. But is there any possibility in his subordinates, do you think? I'm gonna go with those two? Yeah, let's, let's do those two. Yes, I think there is some chance somebody could make a mistake in where they travel and be surprised that actually they get arrested. I think it's more likely they would make a mistake in where they travel. They would maybe not take the whole thing seriously. Some indictments are sealed. Sometimes people don't know they've been indicted. In this case, the court thought it was important to telegraph to Putin, we're watching, because we think you're gonna do more of this. And so um, I think there is some chance, yes. On the issue, the broader question of trying to, you know, I try to get inside Putin's mind a little, but I don't go as far as you did, sir. I mean, this is a guy who launched a war because he wants to be in the tradition of Peter the Great and Catherine the Great. And he's already governing the biggest country territorially on earth, and he also wanted a chunk of Ukraine for himself. I have no defense of Vladimir Putin. He started this war. The only thing I would say is it was predictable that he would view the world this way, and we should have built our policies perhaps a little differently, knowing that he might act this way. But there is nothing defensible about the guy's worldview. He was sitting on 25% of Ukrainian territory when he offered his Christmas peace. So let's, let's keep perspective on that with all due respect. Okay, so we're gonna go to Zoom and then uh, we'll do a lightning round of, of two questions. So uh, let, you know what, let's, um, let's get all three of them sure. and then you can answer them. Okay, go ahead. I'm reading a question from Raul Alcala. How does the theory of the just war relate to the determination of war crimes? Well, that's easy. Okay, uh, <laughs> and so then we'll go to you, and then you, uh, uh, sir. Yeah. Right, you. Me now? Uh, yep, and we'll do them all at once, okay. so go right ahead. I really appreciated the way you brought up everything. 
I disagree with most of what you said, but you brought up other factors too. Now, when it comes to this being, the war was unprovoked. It was provoked when a, a year and a half before, on September 22nd, when a NATO member, Turkey, joined up with Azerbaijan, a total population of over 100 million people ganged up in Armenia and attacked them with a drone attack, which no one stopped. The West didn't stop it. Okay, so, so uh, what's and, and the for question that reason, then? That was why it was provoked. That was a provoked war. He saw what was happening. He was waiting for the Russians, who troops were there to protect okay. Armenia. Okay. He was waiting for them to react, but Putin knew that he had problems fighting the drones. Okay, so, he so let's, let's get our, our third person and then we'll treat them all at once. Thank you. And that, that'll be it for questions. Michael, thank you very much. Really provocative, as you can tell from the reaction of the group. Really appreciate it. Um, my question relates to Yevgeny Prigozhin and the Wagner Group versus the trained professional, so-called professional soldier that uh, is working for Mother Russia and bringing the conversation back to war crimes, if in fact there is a winner of the war and if in fact war crimes can be prosecuted, could you comment on the treatment of these two soldiers on the ground? One, a professional who might take the life of an innocent civilian, uh, and the other, a recently released serial killer from a prison working for an apparently illegal private military company. Could you distinguish those two things for me? Well, yeah, thank you. I'll start with that because, you know, that does get to how I think war crimes law is built. There is a recognition that you can't really use international law to prevent bad things from happening in war, even to innocent people. But you can prevent it from, you can punish it when it is intentional. And, and so that's sort of a guiding concept. And you can also, you know, you can also punishment when it involves underage people who aren't armed, like orphans in orphanages uh, in, you know, one part or another of Ukraine. So, and that gets to the first question about just war theory. There's two ways to think about this. But again, that's why war crimes are a little more complicated to define and, and debate than some would like. But one way to think about just war theory is it, you know, it basically says that war should be a last resort, use minimal amounts of violence, protect civilians. And that sounds sort of like international law on war crimes. Uh, but a more modern variant of just war theory, and a retired general named Jim Dubik wrote a beautiful book about this. He said, you also have to think about your prospects for success. And you, it, you, if you launch a war that's going to tear apart a country and you do it badly, even if you're trying to avoid targeting civilians, and even if you're trying to avoid, you know, raping and pillaging, that you still, at a deeper moral level, may be guilty of, of deep ethical violations, even if the ICC wouldn't necessarily indict you. And so this gets, this is where I do have a little bit of sympathy with the Putin critique of us, not so much the Putin defense of himself, for which I think there is no defense, but his critique of us, that we sometimes think if we were trying to do the right thing, that therefore it's okay. And modern, some modern variation on just war theory You've seen some of this at the Watson Center at Brown University, some other places in Boston, uh, some other people, Dubik at Georgetown, basically have said, we did a poor job in Vietnam, we did a poor job in Iraq, and we should be held ethically accountable, not as war criminals, but as people who made blunders because our strategies were predictably bad enough and had predictably bad enough outcomes that there should be an ethical you know, burden on us as a result. And then to take it back to Wagner versus the Russian military, yes, there is a difference between going out and just as a, you know, released killer slaughtering somebody versus shooting, attempting to kill enemy soldiers. Even if you're on the wrong side, and we would all say all those Russians are on the wrong side, there is an ethical difference between those two people, uh, I think. And that's sort of where a lot of this law and just war theory is meant to apply. Final comment on the Azerbaijan question. You know, I want to, 
I want to sort of acknowledge your point and say Putin would probably use that as part of his defense as well, but I don't see why that allows Vladimir Putin to go kill Ukrainians to get back at NATO or a NATO member for helping Azerbaijan in a war that was fundamentally about Nagorno-Karabakh, which is not inside of Russia. In other words, you're right to say this contributes to Putin's view that he's in this great struggle, the West against Russia, and all these other pieces are part of it. So I accept your, your point if you're trying to get inside of Putin's psychology, but I reject the idea that this could be a defense of what Putin did to Ukraine because you don't go out and punish an innocent country and population because it's something you don't like that happened 500 miles to yourself. And Ukraine deserves the right to make its own choices. The only reason I've been, uh, I've been questionable on and skeptical on the whole idea of bringing Ukraine into NATO is I thought it would produce the very Russian reaction we've seen. So I thought it was a bad idea on the, you know, on the, on the sort of strategy of it. But ethically, Ukraine's in the right and Russia's in the wrong. <laughs> And that's at a broad, I'm not talking war crimes, at a broad strategic level, one country is the victim of aggression and all it wanted to do was choose its own alliances and its own associations. And the other country, or at least its leader, was so caught up in this thousand year old contorted narrative about the emergence of Russian greatness and the preservation of Russian greatness that he got it in his own head th that he was justified in launching this war of naked aggression. So, um, I think he is a war criminal. I would love it if he were uh, held accountable, uh, but I think at a practical level, we're, we're not gonna be able to do that, but we can use the war crime issue in conclusion to at least send a strong message, don't do even dumber things, don't do even more heinous things. And by the way, China, by the way, India, everybody else who's watching, we're sort of tolerating that you buy Russian oil and gas right now. In fact, we're even encouraging it, if we be honest with ourselves, but if, Russia goes off and uses a nuke, everything's gonna have to change. And so it is worth setting some standards using some broader concepts like international law uh, and just war theory to make Putin realize that as much as we hate what he's already done, there are things that he could do that would make this even worse and he will be punished even more severely if he does. That may be the best we can aspire to, but it's better than nothing. And I'll stop there. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Thank you.